Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a miserable and muggy Thursday morning. I mean, this sucks. I woke up to a driving rainstorm, which is fantastic because I'm doing, obviously, photos and video today of this car. Uh, the humidity is in the air. I, I mean, you can't even wear glasses. They're just fogged. I'm wearing them now and I can't see a goddamn thing. Nothing. Uh, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And people who live here, uh, they will understand. We get these flash tropical rainstorms, which are great because they soak everything. They're just uh, hard and fast and quick. And uh, then they stop. And then the sun comes out, this tropical sun that starts baking all the moisture off the ground. And it comes up in heat waves and mist and moisture. And uh, you just feel like you're, uh, like you dived in a swimming pool and you're walking around in a foggy soup afterwards and it's it's absolutely horrible horrible and we're dealing with that now I've heard that there's some cool weather coming and by cool I mean tolerable barely tolerable uh, but I haven't seen it yet and uh, you know if it doesn't arrive eh. It's just May, and, and already, you know, this shit's beginning. So, um, very, actually, it's not even May. It's March. What is it? April. Today's April Fool's Day. Uh, wonderful. And, and, you know, the weather is already making a fool out of me. So we have all of April, which is supposed to be decent weather. And uh, instead, uh, the humidity and the muggy summer shit is already beginning. But uh, anyway, I'm not going to go into all of that. Uh, I'm going to leap right into this car. I won't even get... Okay, well, I'll give you a little bit of news. So I got that two days ago through a friend of mine who has all these weird connections. Uh, I ended up getting a COVID shot. It's not really anything that I had thought about. And it certainly hasn't stopped me from... Uh, doubling down on the COVID whiskey, which I did in bulk this morning. And you know what, before anyone tries to make this political, I, I really have no feelings either way on this thing. Uh, you know, why I did it is when he said, look, the shot's available to you. You can get it. It's the single shot, uh, the Johnson & Johnson thing that apparently makes people's skin fall off. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you want it, you can have it. So I said, yeah, what the hell? Because uh, number one, uh, we're going to be living in this, you know, East Germany type situation where you may need that uh, card that you get from them to get on airplanes and such. So, uh, you know, if I have to take a trip and I needed that thing, rather than go hunt around for it on the fly, I would already have it. So there's that. Uh, number two, and here's the thing. Uh, I have some friends who say, look, this is not a good thing. It's a conspiracy by the government. It's, you know, like the moon landing or chemtrails. And what they're doing is they're injecting tracking devices into you, you know, to, to well, I don't believe it. And I'll tell you why. Because it's not really the people uh, that the government's going to hate who are getting the shots. It's it's the good, normal, <laughs> I don't know, do what the government tells them to do, people of the world. So they're not against those guys. Uh, it's the guys they don't like who aren't getting the shot. So if there's going to be any malfeasance at all from the government, what they're probably going to do is release in the chemtrail some sort of shit that... Uh, takes out the people who haven't gotten this shot. This thing's probably an anecdote. Uh, so I'm using double reverse logic on them. And uh, that way I know I'm going to be fine. I'm going to slip through the cracks, even though I may not be as like-minded as, uh, as some of the people who are double masking right now. But uh, anyway, that's look, that's as political as I'm going to get. Take it as you will. But uh, anyway, uh, long story short, uh, through the whiskey and this uh, Johnson & Johnson shot, I suspect that I'm uh, pretty well protected from uh, whatever the stupid thing is going around. And now we can get right into the car. So I feel very happy to have this thing today. This is a 1985 uh, Toyota Celica GTS convertible. And this is very much a car of my youth. I was about 14, 15 when this thing came out. Uh, there were a few of them, not necessarily the convertible versions, uh, going to our high school. And uh, it's a car that I remember at the time because, you know, as a kid, I read Car and Driver. I read uh, all the automotive magazines, and uh, they really liked the Celica. And uh, I liked it too, although, you know, at the time I wouldn't have been caught dead in one because it didn't have a big V8 under the hood and posi traction in the back. And <laughs> he's the kind that I wanted. So uh, it was basically an aside, but really the hottest chicks 
uh, drove these cars. You know, I mean, we had a cheerleader who went to our high school, and I mean, I mean, she was a friggin' knockout, and uh, she drove one of these cars, and uh, that uh, sealed it in my brain. Uh, but you know, everybody looks at this and they think of the Supra because the Supra is the superstar of the uh, Toyota collectability world. Oh, Supra this, Supra that. Uh, you know, they've gone very collectible. Some of the twin turbo models are fetching like a hundred grand now, uh, which seems ridiculous to me. But whatever, I guess if the market speaks, it speaks. Uh, but uh, anyway, everyone, it's so popular and legendary that BMW decided to produce another one. You know, and God bless them for that. Actually, I'm not kidding. It is actually made. It's it's on a Z4 platform, the new Supra. Uh, it's got a BMW engine, trans, rear end on the Z4 platform, produced in Graz, Austria, by that Magnus Steyr company that screwed up the bed on the... Uh, uh, on the uh, Lincoln Blackwood we did the other day. So, I mean, the new Supras are made by BMW in Austria. And I mean, this is this just shows how weird the world has become to me. I mean, you've got these uh, Fiat Miatas, the Fiat. Now you've got the Supra BMWs. And I mean, I don't even know when BMW and Toyota hooked up. I don't have a clue. And no idea at all. It was complete news to me when I read that. And, uh, you know, whatever. I, I guess, you know, uh, Graz, the uh, Magna Steyr has become the all-wheel drive capital of the world. They make the best all-wheel drive cars, which, of course, makes sense with the weather. And uh, I suppose there's a little bit of Pinsgauer uh, in every uh, new Supra made. But uh, you really can't talk about the history of the Supra without delving into the much more important and much more storied Toyota Seneca. Uh, like this one. Uh, it was made, uh, what, across seven generations from uh, 1970 all the way through 2006. It shocks me, actually, that they did away with it. It was such a popular name. And uh, there is some rumor, some talk, that there may be a four-cylinder style super coming out that might get the Celica name. So I hope so. It'd be nice to see it come back. Uh, but uh, anyway, it came out in 1970, and despite popular opinion, it was not the first affordable Japanese. It's not really a sports car, even when it came out. It was sporty, but not a sports car in the classic sense, and it was not the first either. Uh, it, it absolutely was not. Uh, that would go to, um, uh, what the hell was it, the Yoda Hachi, uh, the Sports 800, <laughs> which was the weirdest little car. Uh, you know, I read a review on it, uh, I can't remember where, and they said, man, it's so weird and endearing, it might as well have been a Citroen, and that's, uh, you know, a mixture of uh, detraction and very high praise, but... That was the precursor to the Celica, and then in 67, uh, Toyota decided to compete uh, with what they saw as the very successful run of cars from Ford, known as the Mustang. Uh, the Mustang was built on a coupe, sorry, on a sedan platform in a 2 plus 2 setup, and uh, was called a pony car, and Ford had tremendous success with it, and Japan and Toyota wanted a piece of the action. Uh, so they uh, had the EX1 concept car, uh, which borrowed a lot from the uh, uh, the 2000 GT. It was sort of a, the, the Celica was basically a cut down, as they call it, 2000 GT, uh, which was not a mass produced car. So you couldn't really call it the first mass produced uh, convertible from Toyota. Uh, but it was uh, quite a sports car. But anyway, they cut it down. Uh, they put it on, I think, a Corona, either Carina or a Corona. God, we should really do one of those today, a Corona platform Toyota. That's great. Uh, but um, uh, anyway, it was the first Japanese pony car, and it was designed for people who, you know, you, have you ever seen an accountant get carried away with air guitar? You know, and then he looks around guiltily like it didn't happen. Those were the guys who might have bought uh, the first Corolla. You know, they went into the Toyota dealership to buy a, uh, sorry, the first um, uh, Celica. They went into the Toyota dealership to buy a Corolla because it fit their idea of what an economical, reliable car should be. Uh, they get carried away with the looks and the style of the Toyota Celica, and they drive off with that thing and then probably feel guilty afterwards. But uh, it helped develop the uh, sporty sub compact class, uh, you know, with the Datsun 510. Uh, if the Datsun 510 was eh, more or less the poor man's BMW 2002, uh, then the Toyota Celica was the uh, uh, was the poor man's Mustang or Camaro or Charger or what have you. And uh, the first gen was very much supposed to be like that. Uh, it was also the first Toyota that really 
was their attempt to take on the world stage and make a global car. And one of the ways you could tell that is it would fit a six-footer with no problem. Uh, prior Toyotas did not have that uh, amenity. They were <laughs> very, very small inside. Uh, if you remember uh, in the Police Academy movie, uh, Hightower had to remove the seats from that middle Honda and sat in the back to drive it. Uh, that's the way Toyotas were basically in the 60s. So, um, But uh, the Celica was different. It would fit a six-footer. It had four seats, and uh, it was uh, pretty much an immediate success for Toyota. They sold a bunch of them. Uh, it was uh, The first gen was the A20 and the A30. It went through a few different revisions over the course of its life, and uh, a bunch of different engines. And as per usual, there was a lot more uh, variation in Japan than in the United States. They always saved their best engines for the home market and that sort of thing. But but anyway, this thing came out, it, it did very well, and uh, you know, then GM decided, you know, shit, we've got to get in this subcompact market, so did uh, Ford and Chrysler and AMC. And uh, very quickly thereafter, well, first of all, they brought out the Opel at Buick dealerships, and that actually did okay. Uh, Ford brought the Carina, uh, or sorry, was it the Katina? I'm like, oh, God, I tell you, I got all these... <laughs> Ford, the, um, uh, the, the Cantina came out, uh, but didn't do well at all. And then in 1970, 71, all of a sudden you get the Gremlin, uh, you get the uh, Pinto, and uh, you get the, um, uh, what the hell else was it? The, uh, the Vega, uh, the Chevy Vega, which was actually very successful. Sold a bunch of cars, but they rusted on the showroom floor, had to be recalled. And uh, as uh, well as they sold, they were kind of a piece of shit, but I still do like them. Uh, the Vega makes a great drag racing platform now. You take this light little Chevy and put a big block in it. People did that for years. Uh, but uh, probably the most interesting of the first gen Celicas to me was the Liftback, which was a direct ripoff of the Fastback Mustang. I mean, it was absolutely ludicrous. Really, really silly. Uh, I mean, it looked just like it from the back. And it's, uh, it's really hard to believe that they ever made it at all. Uh, you know, that, that it was just that much of a ripoff. But uh, anyway, people seemed to like it, and it was kind of cool. Uh, they made it in a liftback form and a uh, coupe, a notchback form. Uh, probably the most uh, notable racing Celica from the uh, early version was the LB Turbo, which was insane. And, you know, you don't really realize shit like this was made back then, but it was... Uh, I don't know, like mid 70, probably 77. It was built by Schnitzer Motorsport. Uh, again, Germans getting involved with this thing. And it had a ridiculous four cylinder turbo with giant. And, and here's an issue it had a KKK turbo, which is a German company that builds turbos that really should have changed its name the way that uh, Jaguar did from the SS car company to Jaguar. Uh, I don't know why KKK turbos kept going as they did for so long, but. Uh, <laughs> Mm, they did. But anyway, it had a giant uh, turbo and a giant intercooler and put out like 560 horsepower and was competing in the Group 5 racing class with Porsche 935s and actually held its own. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a pretty neat car. Anyway, fast forward to 1977, the second gen Celica comes out. Uh, that is the first one to be, the first gen, the first Toyota to be designed in America by their uh, Calty design studio in California. Uh, actually, a guy named David Stollery designed it, uh, who was also a child actor. I mean, you really have to love California. So, uh, even the guy who designs your Toyota acted in I Love Lucy episodes, you know, in the 50s. But uh, it was rounded, it was curved. It was bigger and heavier and wider. And, uh, you know, almost the way that the Datsun Z car had gone from sporty to bulky, so too did the Celica. Uh, but here's the thing. In 78, and coming out in America for the 79 model, and here it is, was the first Celica Supra. And, uh, of course, that uh, is where that legend began. They stretched the front end sheet metal. The rear was the same, but they stretched the front so they could put in a big inline six engine. And that was designed to compete with the Datsun Z car at the time, which was doing quite well. And uh, there is the first generation. Supra. And uh, for that one and for the next one, this generation, they decided to keep the Supra as part of the Celica lineup. Anyway, fast forward to 81, out comes this, the third generation uh, Toyota Supra. <laughs> 
the third generation Toyota Celica. It, uh, you know, it, again, as a pony car, it was essentially meant to compete with people who would buy the Camaro or the Mustang. Uh, also, you know, some of the uh, uh, Japanese offerings at the time. Like the first two generations, it was front-engined and rear-wheel drive. Uh, like the first two, it had, uh, you know, four-wheel disc brakes and uh, independent suspension. Uh, actually, I think there were a few of the third gen that didn't have independent, but anyway, this one did. And uh, it sold really, really well. And it was one of the, you know, it was Japan really celebrating their design philosophy. I mean, no more did they want to go to the California style of rounded edges. Uh, when this thing came out, it was all Japan. The first series, the uh, uh, these were the A40s and the A, no, sorry, the A, oh God, what the hell were they? I always forget that. It was the A60. Um, the first gen of the A60, the first revision, had these weird sort of angled back headlights, almost like a bastardization of the Lamborghini Miura, uh, where they retracted, but you could still see them. Uh, and then in the revision, it went to this black band across with much more proper uh, true pop-up headlights, which I'm an absolute sucker for and love. Uh, they also brought out this version, not quite the convertible yet, but the GTS version. And uh, this is where this generation gets interesting. The GTS was brought out because um, they thought the Celica was getting fat and heavy and losing its sporty roots. So they wanted to address that. Uh, they had made a super version of this car, again, with extended front sheet metal, but everything behind it, there's a cat over there. I knew it. I knew we wouldn't get away without animals. I don't know if he's seen me yet. He's obviously heard me. They have fantastic ears, but yeah, he's flopping around. He's not the big one. Hopefully you don't see that one. Uh, actually, we were talking about the Pinto earlier. It makes me think of that uh, scene from Cujo uh, where the kid's dying in the back of the Pinto and uh, the mother, whatever, I think she was the one from Death Wish. Uh, she smashes the back glass to get into it and the dog tries killing everybody. And that one really had an impact on my youth. Uh, but anyway, the GTS was brought out to uh, reaffirm the Celica's sportiness, and it used a lot of shit off the Supra. Obviously, it didn't have the same front stretch sheet metal because it still has the four-cylinder. In fact, a huge four-cylinder at this point. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but it did have the flares. You see those very cool fender flares from the Supra, the same wheels as the Supra, uh, the same interior from the Supra, and uh, some other parts that, uh, you know, the, the rear independent suspension, the front, uh, you know, the, the revised sport suspension. And the thing handled fantastically well. And uh, it was a, a terrific car overall. Uh, and what's interesting about that is, you know, again, people hearken to the Supra for what it is, but you just can't forget what the Celica did. And then in 84, Toyota got together with the American Sunroof Corporation. I, I've also heard it called the American Special. Specialty Corporation. Eh, who knows? I'm going with ASC, American Sunroof, because that's how I remember it. And they actually created their own big uh, production plant in California to produce convertibles for Toyota, uh, which would be their first factory mass-produced convertible ever. And I know there was that 2000 or whatever, but it wasn't mass-produced. Uh, there was a Toyota open top Celica of sorts called the Sun Chaser uh, in the second gen that was made by a company called Griffith, I believe. And they made eh, maybe a little more than 2,000 of them, and uh, you still see them from time to time. But uh, they had this uh, connecting bar. It was almost like the Porsche Targa that had a bar uh, connecting over the top of the rear quarter panels, a Targa top, and then a uh, zip away back window. So you could get everything down, but you still had that bar. Uh, this was the first true open and top uh, convertible from Toyota, and ASC built it for him, the company that also built uh, Eldorados in the same year, and they made this plant for them. And Toyota, at the time, was very arrogant. I mean, they were not unlike the Germans in their quality control. Uh, the Celic itself was the first uh, Japanese car built by robots, by the way, back in 1970, uh, which was part of why it had such high quality control and, uh, you know, did so very well. But anyway, Toyota was very proud of the reliability. So uh, they had to be very careful about the way this car was going to be built. 
And now here's another fascinating fact about it. It was friggin' expensive. Uh, you know, they diverted whatever ones would become convertibles on the assembly line, uh, strengthened them, did all the stuff they were going to do to them to make them tight to be convertibles. Then they shipped them to ASC, uh, who did the conversion in 27 different steps. And in the beginning, Toyota representatives, probably stern-looking Japanese guys who would have to, you know, do Harry Carey if... Uh, uh, one of the cars failed, uh, inspected every single one of them uh, to make sure that it would fit Toyota quality parameters. They did water tests, they did uh, all kinds of shit to make sure they worked fine. And uh, after they were satisfied that ASC was building a good product, then they just kind of did spot inspections after that. But uh, getting back to what was the thing about this car, it was expensive. And here's something people may not realize today. Uh, your average Celica GTS Cooper notchback was about 11 grand. Uh, your Supra at the time was about 16,500. Uh, the Datsun, the 300ZX, was a little over 17, 171. This Celica, uh, GTS convertible uh, stickered at 17.5. It was much more expensive than the Supra at the time, uh, even without having the uh, six-cylinder engine. It was nearing the territory of the uh, of the BMW E30 convertible, which was out at the same time. That was a little over 20 grand, and even the Porsche 944, which was about 22 grand, which by the way also had a uh, 2.5 liter basically this is 24 uh, but was rear wheel drive with a four cylinder and a stick and auto and uh, was a car that ostensibly this car competed with so uh, you know very interesting to know that this particular Celica outpriced the super at the time and was more than six grand more than its uh, hardtop uh, GTS brother so uh, very interesting stuff anyway what I'm gonna do for a minute is I'm gonna pause the video uh, so I can get the soft top up so you can see it is secretly I've already done that uh, I had to do that this morning so what I'm actually doing is just pausing the video so that I can uh, interject the film that I've already uh, put in and pretend that I'm doing it now but uh, so anyway I'm gonna pause for a minute uh, interject that soft top thing when it's up and uh, then restart and uh, we'll start getting into this car so hold on for a minute all right, so here it is with the soft top up and in place. It's black, which uh, very nicely matches the trim on the rest of the car. Uh, appears to be a pretty new soft top. I would presume it was installed. Uh, you know, either the thing really did sit inside for uh, its entirety or somebody just put this on not too long ago. Uh, the black, uh, sorry, the plastic rear window is crystal clear. Uh, not the tightest thing I've ever seen, but, you know, not bad for... Uh, a reproduction top. Obviously the uh, factory top uh, would long since have not been available for this anymore so uh, let's very quickly get it down. Do that we're gonna hop in and of course this is where the magic of ASC comes into play because they're very very good at this sort of thing. Alright so we release these two guys here and there and here is the power top button. Okay, that is terrifying. You can see the rear seat slam down. I'm gonna put those back up for a minute. Okay, let me get these back up so you can see that. This is friggin' terrifying. Oh my God, that hurts. Okay. So I've got the last, uh, what do I have? The top is released. Here's the rear seats. I'm gonna push this button. <laughs> I mean, those, things come forward and slam in the most violent manner if you're not expecting it it's terrifying absolutely terrifying i had read somewhere that they were just supposed to tilt forward but yeah, maybe that's on another model uh, and then we're going to run down these four windows uh, these back ones by the way um don't want to go down i've got a lock on there they go they had to be made to go down. They were not, they were fixed windows from the factory in the coupe. That's the other side going down beside me. And there's the two front windows going down. So now we have a uh, full on and proper convertible. Uh, I'm gonna get the uh, top cover on it, uh, back on it, and uh, then we'll keep going. All right, so now the soft top is back down. <laughs> And uh, we could start getting into this car. Uh, you know, when I saw it, and the sun's going to come out in a minute and really screw all this up. 
anyway, when I saw it, I was instantly smitten. I was instantly taken and uh, had to buy it almost straight away, and I did. And I tell you what, that has really panned out, not just for me. Uh, in driving this around for the last couple of days, I've been surprised at how many people uh, give you the thumbs. It reminds me of driving that Mark V or that Thunderbird recently. A lot of people have memories of this car and love this car. Uh, you know, I, I took it to get a muffler pipe welded in. Uh, it had uh, a couple of pinholes in it. And uh, the guy who runs the muffler shop, uh, interestingly enough, a guy named Cookie, who, this is fascinating, actually put the turbo mufflers on my Firebird in high school. He's still running that shop today. Still today. Uh, he fell in love with this car and uh, offered uh, to buy it, although he didn't quite come up with enough to, to make it happen. But uh, it just seems that everywhere you turn, people really love this thing and, uh, you know, want to be a part of it. You can't even put gas in it without people asking you. Uh, I'm not always a fan of red cars, and I do love this car in red. I think it's the best color for it. Uh, I love the uh, original striping on it, the GTS badging, uh, those four-star alloy wheels with which were also the super wheels. And uh, I do like that it has radial TA uh, BF Goodrich tires. I don't know why, but they seem to fit the car. Uh, works well. Uh, I do like the, uh, and, and let me, I'm such a sucker for pop-up headlights. Let's do that right now. And of course, being a Toyota, they work flawlessly. And at the same time, I'm like the Lincolns we've been doing. But uh, there they are. So they are true pop-ups. Uh, the first gen uh, of this, or sorry, the first body style of this uh, third gen car would have popped forward from their setback position. Uh, I do think this one looks more uh, proper. The name Celica, by the way, comes from a Latin term called uh, colica, uh, which is celestial or the heavens. And uh, the first Celica wore a badge that... Um, uh, had a uh, some sort of a dragon boat with sails with stars on them indicating that it would sail through the heavens. Uh, I think this one might have a too, but the badge is worn away a little bit, uh, so it's hard to see. But yeah, it does. There, there's a dragon boat with uh, two sails on it that probably would have stars in them. So uh, that's the historical Celica logo. Uh, kind of neat stuff. But anyway, the fender flares, which again were on the Supra, very cool looking on this thing. Uh, Four-wheel disc brakes, tuned suspension for hand handling rear wheel drive which means you can kick it out in corners uh, the next gen was front wheel drive and all the way through 06 forever after it was either front or all so uh, I think these are very special in that and that's one of the reasons I like them uh, they do again have the shorter front end than the super which would have been stretched out a bit to have that um, that inline six but anyway let's just get into this thing I'm gonna sort of miss starting to show up on the paint where I dried off the car uh, so uh, this it was available in a notchback coupe, which obviously made making the convertible easy. And the liftback, which had that big uh, rear liftback hatchback that it shared with the Supra, this would have been much harder to make into a convertible. Uh, but anyway, there you see some nicer, I don't know if they're original formats, but yeah, they are. Look at that, Toyota. They're nice, they're clean and proper. Uh, this guy was thoughtful enough to have... Uh, a convertible repair manual supplement and the repair manual with the car and uh, obviously this uh, pamphlet when he replaced the original soft top so I uh, had a conscientious owner. Uh, ASC designed these hinges specially to not be uh, interfering with where the top went down. You can see they don't go forward of uh, where they mount. Uh, they've got a geometrical design that uh, folds down with these gas things to make them easy to lift up so a lot of planning went into this car and uh, a nice size trunk truly for a convertible uh, unlike many cars of today you could fit like two or three bags of golf clubs in there never mind your infants and toddlers they're gonna fit just fine in there I mean top down you got a shitload of room and the rear seats fold down uh, at the bottom there so you can see you have a pass-through so if you have sniper rifles or skis or uh, whatever it is you want to take with you you can yeah you can have pretty good cargo in this car uh, I brought a box of cassettes with me that I had because I wanted to relive my youth, but the stupid uh, cassette on the original stereo just keeps auto-reversing. That reminds me of the 80s as much as uh, having a cassette at all. <sighs> Have a look under the hood. This isn't going to be easy because it's not... Uh, it's not prop right. It is prop right. It's... Uh, God, how do we get in there? It's not... Uh, gas strutted so I'll try to do this without dropping it on me okay 
Uh, yeah, okay, so here it is, a 2.4 liter four-cylinder engine. Uh, the two, uh, the 22R is one of the most famous, long-lived engines in Toyota history. It's uh, used widely in the pickup trucks. Uh, it's beloved. Uh, this is the 22RE, which came out when all of these engines got Bosch fuel injection, and that upped the uh, horsepower and fuel economy. Uh, the first versions had, I think, 108 horsepower. By the time this one came out, the last gen in 85, the most revisions, uh, it was all the way up to 117. Very Miata-like to me. I mean, it's not loaded with horsepower. It's not going to rip through the quarter mile. Uh, but again, because of the uh, terrific sporty suspension and the rear drive and handles uh, extraordinarily well, and that panned out in reading reviews at the time. Uh, you know, people very favorably... Uh, they, uh, Car and Drivers, my go-to magazine for the 80s, they had just a fantastic crew of writers. And uh, they were lamenting that the Camaro just wasn't as good uh, as the Celica. <laughs> Which is unbelievable, because they really liked the Camaro at the time, the new 82 Camaro. Uh, but they said, you know, the fit and finish, the quality, uh, the balance, the handling, uh, you know, the four-cylinder version is the uh, Camaro that Camaro wished they had, and the six-cylinder, the super version, uh, was the Z28 they wished they had. I, you know, I don't know that that panned out as time went on, because of the, the Z28 became more of a muscle car, uh, which the, uh, I suppose the super did, too. Uh, but, uh, anyway. Anyway, at the time, they really loved this thing. And uh, the 22 series four cylinders uh, were a terrific engine. Uh, Porsche used counterbalance uh, shafts or balance shafts in their four cylinder to make them smoother. Uh, Toyota did no such thing, even though they had about the same displacement. The bigger a four cylinder gets, the more harsh it really becomes. And if there's any criticism of this car, uh, it's kind of the harshness of this four cylinder at high revs. It just does not like peppy revving the way, for instance, the dual overhead cam Miata engine does of, you know, of 10 years later. But um, uh, anyway, it does cruise nicely on the interstate at about two or 3,000 RPM at 80. And uh, it does what it's supposed to do and is one of the bigger four cylinders you could get. I mean, that's a lot of displacement for a four, uh, 2.4 liters. And uh, the fuel injection does make it nice and proper. Uh, you know, this is a, a southern rust-free car. So you can see uh, yeah, zero corrosion anywhere that I can find uh, underneath or in the engine compartment looks terrific and uh, even though Japan tends to overdo all the silly vacuum tubes and emission stuff it's at a minimum in this car you can kind of see the engine you can see the intake uh, you can see the exhaust manifolds and uh, it you know it's pretty clean for what it is so let's get that back down oh for the mother god sorry about that Drop that too hard, too. I love this uh, tonneau cover it has with the Tron type rigid styling that's even a little higher than I would expect. And even the details where it includes this little um, thing for the back window. If you want to put the windows up, it has a, a very beautiful, that's from ASC, mind you. That's not Toyota. And they did a nice, nice job. Uh, the seats in the back, eh, you're Canadians. They're going to be chipper enough. They're used to fitting in tight places back there. And these uh, side panels in the rear are all custom made uh, to work with the, um, uh, the convertible version. The coupe had different ones. And, of course, these windows were fixed on the coupe. So uh, I'm going to hop in and pull forward out of the sun because that's about to come out and annoy me. That's the keys. Uh, let me pull it forward. I will do a quick review of uh, what's inside. So inside, uh, because the Celica, or sorry, the Super was Celica based, everything in here is basically exactly the same as it was in the beloved collectible Supra. Uh, the instrument panel hump, the steering wheel, uh, the dashboard, the radio, the climate controls, the door panels, and most importantly, uh, these seats. These were absolutely beloved beloved seats at the time. Uh, they're considered to be more comfortable than Recaro's. They're adjustable. Uh, you see it has this cool little blow-up thing, which actually works. So what you do is you blow this thing up. <laughs> silly doing it, but you do it. And then there's these three buttons on the side uh, which release 
the air in different levels of the lumbar uh, to uh, make it so that you're comfortable when you're inside. And uh, man, the way they grip, the way they have just the right amount of bolster uh, for your thighs, for your back, for your sides. Uh, even today, these are considered to be way better than some of the current seats made. I mean, they're just that good. Uh, and uh, again, they were directly out of the Supra. Uh, they're adjustable. These headrests come up. They can go forward. And uh, you could really tailor make these seats how you want them. Uh, you know, unless you're very good at the adjustments, you know, this kind of thing here, this kind of thing here, uh, the passenger seat will probably end up being more comfortable for you. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, they're, they're just really nice. Uh, this is a really dumb storage compartment that doesn't feel like it would fit anything of substance, but it's there. Uh, you do have a very razor thin, uh, what do you get, one of those LCP Rugers or something? You might fit that in there, but otherwise, gun storage is pretty crappy in this car. Then there's your uh, trunk and gas release. Here's your hood release. Uh, you could get some of these with digital uh, gauges, but uh, truly the analogs were better. And they do give you a full gauge package. In the 80s, early 80s, was all idiot lights. Uh, this gives you a true voltmeter, obviously a gas gauge. You got your clock in the middle, digital clock, uh, your temp gauge, and your oil pressure gauge. And uh, then, of course, your TAC, your 8,000 RPM TAC, red line just before 6, and uh, 130 mile an hour speedometer. Uh, which I think this thing would do in the 115 range or so. So, uh, you know, it wasn't a race car, but it was still pretty quick. Uh, the steering, can't tell if it tilts or not. It does. It has a tilt wheel. That's pretty fancy stuff for a Toyota. You got your hazards up top. You have to push this to release the key. Uh, you've got your uh, cruise control, which is part of the uh, high-end GTS package. They also came with air conditioning. Uh, you have a cigarette lighter. Uh, still pretty big, but smaller than the 70s. And uh, then this ridiculously complicated uh, AM FM cassette that uh, was just exactly what you'd expect from Japan at the time. Uh, you know, maybe your kid could figure it out, but uh, way too many friggin' buttons for most people. <sighs> what did I do with the damn keys for this thing? Oh, for the mother god. Where did I put them? Probably sitting on them. I'm sure you guys love waiting for me to find the damn keys. That's fantastic. All right, there they are. We have two keys, the original stuff. They're a little tired now, but they're, eh, they're good. Just 96,000 miles on this thing. Uh, there's a little weirdness with the title. Yeah, people want to buy it and love hearing that, but uh, the guy who got the title for it, uh, yeah, I know it was the original owner or how many, but he went to the DMV and just guessed the mileage at 99. So the title shows 99,000 actual miles uh, when in fact it had 96,542 or whatever it had then. It would have been nice if the guy took an actual reading instead of just guessing. So uh, anyway, it's impossible to fix now, so it just is what it is, but uh, a true 96,000 miles on this car, which is pretty damn low for uh, for this platform and certainly for that engine. Uh, you got all the original books in there, very nice stuff. And I think, yeah, that's the uh, uh, receipt for the uh, soft top, which was put on sometime in March. So not that long ago. And there you feel that 22 fire up. And again, it's not the smoothest or most pleasant of engines. I mean, that's, you know, what you would get the overhead cam six for in the Supra, uh, but it's certainly good enough. And it's a very, very peppy uh, four cylinder, uh, you know, not Miata levels with the dual overhead cam, but still pretty damn good. And uh, because of the displacement actually has some torque, uh, you've got, uh, I don't know what this does. That's your power lock switch, actually. Uh, that's your power top switch. Here's your electric mirrors. Uh, you could get these with a five-speed or a four-speed automatic with overdrive. Uh, whoever got this one got the uh, automatic. Uh, you got an ashtray in there with dual sides for twin Japanese smokers and uh, a nifty little center console there, which again isn't going to hold much of a gun. Uh, here's your uh, cruise control that also has your wipers on it, and here's your headlamps. So, and uh, I think this... Uh, uh, this is ASC. That's not a Toyota window switch mechanism. They had to make that uh, because now all of a sudden the back windows go down. Uh, also, this header panel. I think the way the sun visors mount are unique to the convertible. And but you can tell I me mean, you can see the quality that went into this thing. Why Toyota chose ASC, which they still use today, by the way. Uh, they made uh, the next gen 
convertibles and the Saneras and I think they're still making Toyota stuff today with uh, the relationship they have and you can see why they chose them they're a great company uh, you know even in that Eldorado they just do a fantastic job of uh, making a convertible that's up to factory standards for Toyota to sign off on them in the 80s it had to be pretty good uh, because uh, again Toyota was a bunch of arrogant bastards at that point All right, off we go Uh, this sun's going to be annoying, so I'm going to wait till we get to the end of the street and uh, pick it up when we uh, turn right. Okay, so you can see, again, not really a race car, uh, particularly in this uh, four-cylinder automatic form, uh, but it gets up and goes. You know, that was 65 miles an hour. I think we got there in about eight or nine seconds. Uh, the quarter mile is like 17 seconds, so uh, this is much more about balance and handling than it is about straight line acceleration. If you wanted that, go for a Super or a Z28. Uh, but if you wanted to have a little bit of fun throwing it around the corners and still getting pretty good fuel economy, then the Celica was for you. Uh, interestingly, again, this car costing a grand more than the Supra, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, you really had to love convertibles. But what a fun car to cruise around in, I have to say. And as much as, I mean, you feel, obviously it's a Toyota. You don't feel like anything's going to break, even though the car's like, I don't know, what, 35 years old at this stage. Uh, you just feel like it's tight together nice. It has this weird... Uh, boxy center hub with the two prongs the same one that would have been in Camry's at the time but it's good enough and feels nice and if it had one prong it could have been on a Citroen uh, you know the gauges very nicely laid out they're not um, they're not screwed up you've got uh, your controls there uh, the radio let's see if we got anything on here in the oldie station Easily recognizing it, but it sounds uh, sounds pretty mellow. I do like the big uh, built-in graphic equalizer. I think that's cool. And uh, ready for a nice cruise. So there it is, a 1985 Toyota Celica GTS convertible, uh, 96,000 miles. I really like this car. I'm not gonna lie. It's a lot of fun to drive and uh, a lot of fun to show off. Even though that's not really my thing. I like a low profile, but. Eh, and this car will put up with it. Uh, it's going to be for sale at Auto House. If you have an interest, you can go to their website, autohousenaples.com, or at 239-263-8500. Uh, I'll do a little highway clip at the end of this thing, but uh, I don't know. I haven't really tested the um, tonneau cover. I don't know if it's properly latched down. I'm a little nervous about running 100 in it, so I'll do a quick little shot to 80 miles an hour and then get back down again. And, uh, hopefully our tonneau cover doesn't go flying off. So, uh, Thank you very much for having a look. Appreciate it. Going to try to get some more fun stuff coming up soon. Really appreciate the views and the comments and all the new subs. And I tell you what, man, it's, uh, you know, a couple of guys said I've, I've helped people get through the coronavirus thing, which is way more credit than I could ever deserve. But you guys sure as hell have helped me get through it. That's for damn sure. Uh, it's been an absolute joy. Uh, making these videos and uh, having a lot of fun with it. So thank you very much for uh, for showing up to watch them, and uh, we'll keep trying to pump out some good ones. Uh, take care, and we'll see you with the next one.